What's happening, Valerie? Okay, you told me this shirt that you're wearing, for those of you who are not watching, um, mm. Chad's wearing a cool Ausla shirt. You yeah. Said this is an old Ausla shirt? Oh, that's yes. a cool one. No, this one is cool. Yeah. Um, this one is from, Rare. I think around the time that we were doing like the Japan pop-up. Yeah. You know, it's it's funny about the Ausla merchandise. I do see a lot of these Zillennials and people who come to our shows wearing Ausla stuff. It's kind of starting to become vintage. It is, because it's, yeah. not, it's not producing anymore, right? No, I, don't, any... I believe their last line probably was in like 2019 or something. Yeah, so if you see any like Ausla merch out there, it's vintage. It oh. is vintage. Oh, yeah. Ooh. And uh, it's kind of interesting because we forget about how electronic music merchandise is, let's just say, not always the most inventive. Mm-hmm. And I think that a lot of the... Cur- We've been getting better. Better, yeah, for better. sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of the aesthetics that I see in a lot of cool merchandise from our scene can be derived from like this Ausla stuff mm-hmm. you know, and like other yeah. things too, yeah, from that era. I feel like that was the closest we ever got to like... For example, Camp Flogna happened recently, uh-huh. and even being in LA around the time, you could see when people are going to Camp Flogna because like everyone's wearing cool shit. Like everyone has like the style or like the pieces or whatever. And I feel like the Ausla merch era was the closest we ever got to like the street style meets merch yes. collab. In yeah, dance music. totally. Yeah. I mean the 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 products were super quality, uh, Very. cut and sew. Like really, I remember like. I had like a little discount that they gave me at the pop-up that was over in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. So I went there one day and I bought a hoodie and uh, our friend was working there and I was like, she was like, oh yeah, we'll we'll give it, this is free. And I was like, oh no, 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 let me just, I'll just do the discount. I want to, I want to support. And she was like, all right, cool. That'll be a hundred dollars. I was like, oh damn, like, damn the, the discount. Mind. Okay. <laughs> you should have just taken the free one. I you know. Could. Is that one of those moments where I'm like, can I actually kind of rewind that for a second? Yeah, Let's go like, ahead and comp this mind. one. Um, but yeah, shout out Ausla. Um, wow. Everyone, it, it's happened on this show, but in, I hear it more and more. People want Ausla come back. So Sunny, hello. There's no way you're listening We're to this, calling. but if you are, <laughs> We're calling. Hello. Answer uh, the phone. <laughs> So how are you doing? Giving me some observations about things. Like we're coming up on Thanksgiving now. I know. The holidays. Quickly, yes. imminent, imminently approaching. Yes. Uh, what are some things that you've been up to that you've witnessed? As... Witnessed, experienced, experienced. lived. Uh, well, I feel like the first thing that comes to mind was we were both there. Uh-huh. We recently here in LA had a mayhem of a week of Fredigan shows. I think yes. it was originally it was originally eight shows, right? Originally, yeah, an eight plus one. Yeah, and then they yeah. added an extra show where mm-hmm. he ended up just DJing freestyle or Fred style. Um, but that was the most recent thing. I feel like that was a big talking point because it felt like everyone in LA went to that show yeah. because there were so many of them, first of all. And obviously everyone loves Fred. And it was a cool show. What did it, you think of it? It was. Um, I thought it was easily one of the best electronic music shows I've been to in the last five to seven years. Wow. Mic yeah. drop. Yeah. Big mic drop. Um, you know, I think that his music is very manic. Like he oh. he may it may be a reflection somewhat of even his own personality. Uh, a little bit of that ADD, a little bit of that you know samples here and chords here, and just a lot of different elements. Totally. Um, so I thought that there was an there was a very satisfying blend of both high and low um and yeah it was cool i do think the tightest part of the set is when he did go in the middle and he performed all his bangers back to back on and i feel like what they were trying to do there was emulate the success of his boiler room show mm-hmm. and have like a little bit of like a segment of the show that kind of spoke to that as part of his musicianship what did yeah, you yeah for sure no i think 100% that and i almost feel like a lot of the milestone performances of his career in the recent like year, year and a half, two years have been trying to emulate that kind of like comes from club culture, like really involved because we recall the Coachella performance with Skrillex and Fortet and how they went to the middle of the crowd and they were like in it, even though it's like a huge festival stage. But I think 100 percent that show was outstanding for the production side of things. I think yeah. I agree. I thought Personally, I've seen Fred again a lot, and it's funny because I like I tweeted about this after seeing the show, 
And people were like, oh, you're a Fredigan hater. And I was like, no, honestly, I actually consider myself an early Fredigan stan because I <laughs> loved Fredigan. You have been on this train. I've been on the train and not even I'm not even trying to say like hipster, like I found him first because I definitely didn't find him first. But I was early on being like, this is cool. I like this sound. This is different. And so I've seen a lot of sets. And I will say that it's really interesting now seeing him at this stage in his career where he has so many songs he is like a monster at releasing albums just back to back to back basically and it's almost like he has so many songs that i feel like it's hard to stuff into one set that Mm -hmm. it's like just his set like not a festival like trying to you know bring up the vibes of an ending festival set like it's just his headline show so i did feel like that was an interesting thing to see him kind of work through but i will say that the show itself overall was like so well thought out Production was amazing. If you haven't seen the videos, like you have to go check them out because it's at the venue in LA called The Shrine. And for those who have never been, The Shrine is kind of like, I would almost describe it a little like a hallway, even though it's bigger than a hallway, but it's a very long venue where like you're kind of just like, you're kind of limited to what you're able to do in there usually. It's literally a hall. It's, there you go, a hall. So, it it was really cool, and I think he had the very genius idea to do these eight shows back-to-back instead of selling out, like, a huge, enormous venue because he could just set up the production once and then do it for eight days in a row and not yeah. have to move a single thing, which, you know, is so expensive when totally. you're touring. Totally, so. Yeah, I think that... Um... I think Shrine is the the reason why it's like so coveted in Los Angeles mm. as being this like pinnacle milestone is that it's the biggest venue that you can perform in as an electronic music artist before mm. you get into essentially like arenas right or yeah. you know and and then stadiums like yeah. like basically the Shrine is that last rung of that ladder before you climbed up to Doing a, a massive coliseum, sports arena, crypto, BMO, <laughs> all of the names of the, but like <laughs> those level stadiums. venues, you yeah. know, when we're talking about five figure attendance. Um, yeah. So there's something powerful about the reason that venue is a, a milestone. What yeah. I will say is that the acoustics in there are hit or miss, depending on where you are. For sure. I would say that's one of the worst features about the shrine typically is that. Sometimes it sounds like a tin can in there, honestly. Yeah. It, it, I really, at that venue especially, jump right in the middle of the crowd. Just mm-hmm. get right in there. You're going to have the best time. A lot of times all access or, you know, industry area. The upstairs is, area. And it, it's yeah. good sight lines, but, like, I want to be in the show, yeah. you know? And I've got definitely gotten more into the, like, put me in the middle of the show. Because um, Offelstein, I that. just jumped right in there. Yeah. Maddie on, I was with the peeps. The, peep, with, the peeps. with my people. The people's, um, yeah, it's good. And it was great. And like as a music fan, I think that's the experience you want. I mean, in 2008, I went to Hard Haunted Mansion at the Shrine, and it's the entire Shrine. <laughs> Back then, if you remember, there was the outside area as well, yeah. which was the parking lot, which was the second stage, mm-hmm. which was actually the main stage. But anyway, long story short, that was, as a music festival, still to this day, I would probably say the most influential music festival of my life. Mm. Um. Just an unbelievable collection of talent. Dead Mouse's breakthrough set, Soul Wax's unbelievable set, Justice DJ set, wow. Crystal Castles, Crookers, DJ AM dressed up as Daft Punk, um, <laughs> on and on. Wow. But that was when I realized the true power of the shrine. And basically, what I'm getting at is like, I think for people outside of LA, they hear like, oh, we did H Ruins. And I don't know if the cultural or like the significance translates, but. Here in LA and and I think regionally, people understand that that venue holds a lot of like very special. No, um, I'm really glad you explained it that way. Cause even I honestly, you know, it's easy to kind of laugh or almost just be like, what an interesting approach to do eight shrines in a row instead of doing like a big arena or something like that. But it is so true because I think that's something that we're seeing a lot of right now is like artists that have had this kind of massive growth over either pandemic times or even the past few years of just like social media, TikTok, if it is that. It's interesting to see these artists rise to such a level without the years of practice that typically most artists go through of like playing opening sets and like playing little rooms and then moving up and up and up. So I actually think it was a really smart decision 
for him and his team to do it this way. Because like you said, the Shrine is an iconic venue. To be able to do eight nights and like make a whole show out of it was a really smart way to approach it. And again, I think the production was really thoughtful and it was like tasteful. Like it wasn't over the top. Like he didn't have some crazy like stage setup. It was just like, oh, let's put some screens in different places and like yeah. utilize them in a smart way. Let's one of the, move him around the crowd. Yeah. And one of the things about lighting that was cool, there were mm-hmm. several little lighting tricks that they did that were fun. One, they yeah. had those really bright uh, white lights around the perimeter of the the upstairs balcony. And then- out of nowhere, they just all went on, mm-hmm. and everyone was like, "Oh shit!" It was very bright in there. It's very bright, and then they had like those kind of like star-looking hanging lights that they put. In. So there's a nice, there's nice devices and different uh, elements that they incorporated throughout the show yeah. to make it feel like a living kind of experience. I, I thought it was a top-notch show. Don't get me wrong, and I don't, you know, I could break down X's and O's about what, you know, different ways you could have done it, but I think ultimately, you know, it. it 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 lived up and surpassed a lot of the expectations that I had. And what I will say about the shrine, the last thing is that, you know, in 2019, we sold out the shrine. And I got to say, out of all the things that have happened in my career, I think that might have been the most important. Mm. Um, and the reason being is that, you know, I have this theory, if you will Do tell. Enter- Do tell. <laughs> allow me Please. to expand. I think that the shrine, um, the exposition, what was it? Exposition Park, mm-hmm. uh, where, you know, EDC used to be, and USC, that area. Which right. they're all very close very for those close. who don't live in LA. Yeah. You know as a UC grad. Yeah. Um, USC grad. Uh, I I firmly believe that that is where the electronic music boom in America started. And if Ooh. it weren't for that particular region, mm. it would not have exploded the way it did. And yeah. the reason why is because I, I was there through, you know, 2007 up until now. And, you know, there, were, there was just all this stuff happening at the Shrine electronic music wise with Gary Richards doing hard and all of these people's shows. And then you had EDC at the Coliseum and at the sports arena did Daft Punk and mm. all of this stuff was happening in this little block radius. Meanwhile, electronic music expanding into the frats. People are DJing yeah. new sounds. I was one of the people DJing in those frats. At first they only <laughs> wanted hip hop. Two years later. Like I was there, yeah. Chad in the frat DJing. <laughs> <laughs> those same muscled out bros wanted to wear neon and listen to Swedish House Mafia and Avicii, you know? And yeah. I think a lot of people went there, saw it, and brought it back to their hometown, mm. their school, their area. So, you yeah. know, it's kind of, there's a bit of um, interesting symbolism in it being called the shrine, because I've always felt <laughs> of it being uh, somewhere that you need to pay respects to and like is like a, a cultural mecca for a scene. Wow. Yeah. That's poignant. That's yeah. very cute. Yeah. No, I think you're right. Because, I mean, as you're saying that, I remember I didn't live in L.A. at the time when EDC was in L.A. at the Coliseum. And I remember when it, like, entered my sphere of yeah. knowledge where, like, people that I went to high school with were messaging me being like, oh, did you hear about this EDC event? Like, look at the photos. And I was like, what is this? This looks so cool. And at that time, I was, like, so distant from things. Like, I was getting into the music, but, like, I hadn't yet even been to L.A., so I didn't know. But even at that point, that's when it started spreading. So I think you're right. Like, that is that is a moment that you can track back to to be like, this is when people started to care about this stuff in a mainstream level. And it's also interesting because I do feel like one of the best parts about that era was that things were so new and people were just doing things that had never done before and just trying things. And obviously some of them worked, some of them didn't. And I kind of feel like that is one of the best parts about, you know, this Fred again era. As much as people, I think, sometimes are a little like tired of hearing the name Fred again all the time. I will say that it feels very fresh, like everything that he has been doing and him and like his respective little gang of, you know, Skrillex and Forte and whoever else he brings along. They're willing to like use the power they hold and like try new things again, which I really appreciate because I think it's hard when you're at a certain level of fandom and artistry to be willing to take risks like that like sometimes it's like oh there's so much on the line like so many people on my team like maybe I should just do the show the way it's supposed to be done or something you know but like he's out here doing eight nights in a row at the shrine which is already kind of an interesting and unique approach and then he'll add on another night and be like I'm gonna DJ this one and it's just gonna be like free flowing which is like again not very common like you don't see that often um, and I think that that energy is really nice. I think that's that's something that we can definitely appreciate at the shrine. Yeah, where we're absolutely. Paying our respects. Totally. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think I think you're right, and I think that he, 
I think that it speaks to the open-mindedness of the fan base, even though a lot of them may have discovered him through very mainstream means or are only there for the hits. Mm. I do think it speaks to like people are open to having a different kind of experience with their dance music. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this kind of transitions into my next point that mm. I was thinking about because Fred, again, obviously someone who sold, you know, ostensibly, what, 45,000 tickets at these shows. Crazy. So you got to imagine that anyone who could do that, especially in Los Angeles, must be pretty big. Mm-hmm. Um, however, it made me start to think a lot because I was listening to a podcast called Plain English with Derek Thompson on uh, The Ringer. And he was talking to someone about fame. Mm. And as we're getting further along as a society and a culture, I almost wonder if now, because the monoculture is completely um, evaporated and mm. and there is no like unifying big things that happen, um, that all or of few, us- Few, few and few, far few, between. Mm-hmm. Right, like celebrity deaths is one. That was one that yeah. people talk about. People talk about this. I've heard this theory come out. I'll let you finish your thought also. But Game of Thrones being such a big moment for people as far as like entertainment and television goes, because we no longer watch cable. We're not all beholden to like one time where the show comes out kind of now with HBO. But like Game of Thrones is one of the first that brought us back to that where we're like every Sunday night, we're like, what's going to happen on the next episode? And like, that was actually really fun. As yeah, a society to but, do that so that but that was like um four or maybe five years ago almost mm-hmm. and you know one stat that was pointed out in in this book called the 90s by chuck closerman is that the average episode of seinfeld on any given night had more viewers than the game of thrones finale collectively so mm. you know the mono culture the one thing that we all have in common um you know people because matthew perry passed away people were talking about friends yeah. you know that is a monocultural thing that has existed through generations through age through you know different cultures and languages mm-hmm. uh and barriers and the amount of things that are like that these days are fewer and fewer um mm. obviously there's things on netflix and you know but it had me thinking about music you know fred yeah. again is this in your you had just even said yourself oh we're tired of hearing of fred again I think that there are a lot of people that have no clue who he is. For sure, which is interesting because actually recently the um, Grammy nominations came out for this coming year. And I think myself and a lot of other people were surprised to see that Fred again actually made it into the best new artist category. Nice. Alongside like people like Ice Spice and like other really big pop names where you're like, oh, wow. Like, I think you're right. I think a lot of people will look at that name in the new artist category and be like, who the hell is this? <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, but to, but let's be fair. Like, you know, because of his songwriting background for Ed Sheeran and other people and mm-hmm. like his industry credibility. Yep. I mean, it, it would be really hard to not include that as part of the criteria. Like we all, we all know that the Grammys, there's an industry, you know, component to it that we don't see yes. uh, as the viewers. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, that's why a lot of people, I think, you know, for better or worse, you know, have called into question the validity of a Grammy nomination. I do think it's super important. Yeah. But like, you know, I'm just saying like, it's amazing. It's an amazing thing. But, you know, so my my point is that an artist can sell this many tickets, be so culturally relevant in one context. Obviously, he did fill in as a headliner at Coachella, albeit with two other people. Mm Mm-hmm. But it got me thinking, you know, like the subjective nature of fame. This is one mm-hmm. of the things that was brought up on this podcast. It was like, you know, anyone can become famous now. And also mm-hmm. like fame, like it, it's not, it's like more of a meritocracy now, right? Where it's like, you could post a video right now that just blows up and now you're famous. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, well, now you're, now you didn't have to really, you know, if you did it right now without any prior experience, yeah, there was nothing that was leading up to that like, your resume, your cosigns, any of this like the stuff. hard work that you put in, like all of that. Yeah, yeah. It all kind of just like comes based off the merit of, you know, any of these TikToks, some of them have more viewers than like, like an individual video will have more viewers than most TV shows or most yeah. movies, you know, whatever, most movies that people saw. Yes. So anyway, my point being is that I think celebrity is becoming extremely subjective and fame is like, there is no like universal fame Hmm. as there were in previous generations as a result of these tools we have. Right. So 
my point is, I think within the music industry, the changing of a celebrity uh, is going to affect it in the sense that, like, I think only people before a certain threshold will be able to be like those arena selling mm. ubiquitous fame kinds of artists. And I think everyone else after that, I, I think that we're going to have a headliner problem with new artists hmm. um, where I think that the headliners are going to come more from like cultural sides of things like I, we've talked about before yeah. um, from different regions, from, you know, the cultural significance of the Latin scene, you know, stuff yeah. in Korea. But overall, there may not be those artists that like our parents know. For example, most of the people who are able to crush it in that way, I think were famous before a certain time in the 2010s. So mm -hmm. it's like, let's say the cutoff is like 2019, okay? So it's like Harry Styles, <laughs> Taylor Swift, Beyonce. Ariana Grande, Beyonce, The Weeknd, Ed Sheeran. Like these are the people that I think had cemented their their careers and their mm -hmm. notoriety. And so at, now that they're, bef they're before that threshold, everything after that, I think you're gonna see a lot more difficulty with these artists selling tickets because hmm. one of the things about like a, a festival like Rolling Loud is there's like a finite amount of rappers that could be a bona fide headliner. Mm -hmm. And basically you're like, you're kind of like recycling through all of them. So if Kendrick Lamar or Travis Scott or one of these artists doesn't have like an album at the time that coincides with some of these festivals, then who's going to replace them? Who is like actually famous mm. in that regard? Those artists that I mentioned, they made it before the, that 2010 threshold as well. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting outline and assessment kind of looking at it because I definitely don't disagree in the sense of it does feel way harder to have the kind of, like you said, monoculture momentum that like someone like Beyonce or someone like Taylor Swift had, even though obviously even just with those two artists, like they have very specific fandoms, but also they had such a huge placehold, I think in wider culture that like, even if I personally am not a Taylor Swift fan, I know a lot about her and know like who she's dating or what she's talking about and all that kind of stuff. But it's interesting because I do actually think, I don't know if I fully agree with the point because as you were listing the names of the artists, in my head, I was thinking, okay, there's not a lot of artists on that list that I would personally buy tickets for, but there's a lot of people out there who would buy tickets for all of those artists. Like I think of an Ed Sheeran, for example. His music is fine. I like it. I'm not like a huge fan, but when it comes on the radio, I'm like, this is cool. I personally would probably never buy a ticket to his show myself. But there's so many people out there who will. And I think it applies to the same way of like these new genres that I think we're we're seeing more of. Right. So like these Latin artists, K-pop artists, whatever the next new genre is going to be. There's so many people out there, I think, who just like maybe haven't had their moment with like an Ed Sheeran. That's Ed Sheeran to them. You know what I mean? But like, look at Bad Bunny. He can sell out all those arenas. Look at Blackpink, they can sell out like five arenas all at one time. You know what I mean? So right, but will your mom know who those people are? Yeah, like, that's a good point. Because yeah. I'm saying like the all the side. all the traditional outlets like talk shows and the VMAs. We talked about mm. that, and we talked about award shows. They've all declined in cultural significance, almost to a point of like irrelevance. I would mm. say because now if Twitter doesn't exist, the landscape for discussion and sharing of, um, you know, fame is going to fracture even more, mm. right? So like one of the reasons why award shows like kind of kept relevance is so everyone's live tweeting at the same time, like, oh, we're all watching this, right. you know? Mm. Like obviously the Chris Rock, Will Smith thing was like kind of the best thing to happen for Twitter <laughs> and the Oscars ever. Yes. I just think that it's, it, again, it's not better or worse. I'm just, I'm just saying that like, I would be surprised, you know, if any of the ways in which our celebrities and musicians were, you know, built and revered continues mm. because i'm starting to see everything leaning so much more legacy heavy and for this pre-threshold of the the meritocracy or the 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 evening out of fame you know yeah because like like yeah bad money can sell out dodger stadium or all these arenas and like again the everyday person may not have heard who that is because it's right. not within their purview um you know i i I'm just interested in it because, you know, I think, does it show that it's completely viable that you don't actually need to be mainstream famous anymore? You know, uh, is, has it like, cause like yeah. Mr. Beast has his own candy bar. 
and like yeah you that's know the whole thing. That, that's like the most <laughs> famous person arguably in america which right? is crazy because i know i mean i think i know enough about him but i don't know anything about him at the same time right you know what i mean right yeah so fame is an interesting thing like i almost wonder if like fame will even matter to being a successful musician in the well, that's what i think the kind of beauty of it is is that like maybe yeah maybe it doesn't matter that much anymore and i think it is more important now i think for an artist to just develop something that's authentic to them which sounds kind of silly because obviously that's like what most artists would say like at any point in history but it feels like when i think about it you know we're talking about fred again i think the reason why people gravitate towards his music so much is because there's so much story in his music that people are like, oh, I like relate to this. I feel this, especially because it was like coming out of pandemic times where people were like feeling that need for connection. And all his music is about like human connection and even like the visuals and like the little iPhone videos and all that stuff. And then I think of like a new jeans or like a black pink on that side. And I'm like, people care so much about them like as individuals and it doesn't really matter i mean like yes it matters that they're famous but like maybe the fame doesn't actually matter like they just get so excited being like oh i'm lisa or like i'm a jenny and like i see myself in her and that's why i love her so much and it's very just like one-to-one relationship rather than like like full famous celebrity style but there are still people that care about that well no i mean obviously celebrity does matter i mean one example is the mcdonald's artist branded uh meals that they were doing right okay so travis scott had his meal which was the first one that like set off you know those records of you know mcdonald's has done well to stay relevant within the culture and they use primarily music artists as their spokespeople or their you know vessels Mm. the bts meal with the uh in the, the I feel sauce. like I'm not up to date on these uh, McDonald's artist collabs. Yeah, this is a very <laughs> big. This one. is a very big thing. They had a Sweetie meal. They had a Cardi B and Offset one. I love that you know this so well. I do, and <laughs> but now it's kind of like now that angle within. Um, I'm sorry that I do know this. Okay, so yeah. I, just, <laughs> I apologize. I appreciate. But like it. Jack Harlow. Okay, they had a Jack Harlow meal at KFC. Come on, is Jack Har- news to me? <laughs> but I'm just saying, like Jack Harlow, like if we really ran it and we really thought about it, and we compared the fame of Jack Harlow to like Ludacris back in the peak of the mm. 2000s, like think about the difference in fame, mm. right? Like Ludacris had to require millions of people to actually go buy a physical CD. Like True. Jack Harlow can just be famous from just people just literally looking at one phone and just not ever having to do anything outside of their comfort zone right yeah. so jack harlow being famous and getting his own kfc meal was more of a, a statement on the subjective moving goalposts of fame and how that applies to marketing rather than him actually being famous you know hmm. my last point is that i went to dunkin donuts <laughs> in florida and they had an ice spice flavor okay okay this ice spice flavor okay, i'm sensing a passion point between fast food music and chad <laughs> well let me tell you this is the holy trinity of chad uh, yeah this of, is a surprising passion is, point i didn't know these about. these are three things i love and yeah. the third one is me right so that's what <laughs> um but they had this ice spice flavor but they didn't have her image anywhere which i find like kind of Whoa. hilarious because if you're buying a a that Dunkin' weird. Donuts beverage, and it's called the Ice Spice Latte or Ice Spice Drink. You're not going to think that that's anything except a name that they're like pumpkin spice, ice spice. Like, what? How are you sure it was like an ice spice collab? Yes. Yes. That's interesting. And Why would they not use her face on that? I don't know. I'm Maybe she wasn't that. famous enough to put on the actual, like, the actual, like, video menu. But it, I just thought it was funny that, like, it's the Ice Spice Drink. And it's like, Okay, like, how would anyone know what that is other than, like, the extremely devoted, you know, under under yeah. 20-somethings who, you know, are, are I know. It? I'm wondering if that's also just, like, marketing people being idiots. Kind I feel of. like that's honestly the root of a lot of but like, honestly, they, things. Like but <laughs> honestly, like, I don't know if it, it was, it has to do with, like, the amount of money that it, that the artist would be getting in free promotion to have their, their face on mm. the menu of every McDonald's in the country. There has That's to really be some trade off there for sure. Because I'm like, is Ice Spice advertising Dunkin' Donuts that hard that like it was worth it for them to? It's someone in their marketing division that was like, 
oh, yo, she's popular with this age demographic. We're lacking in this at Dunkin' 100%. Donuts. That's exactly Throw what the, happened. Totally. And but not enough to use her name because that's too much promotion uh, using our, yeah, interesting. The other thing that I've huh. noticed is a, <laughs> uh, this is this is kind of a hot topic, Val. So oh, I came in fire Hotter than today. the last one? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. I'm ready. So, you know, we've seen the Taylor Swift era's tour wrap with like the most unanimous fanfare and support of a public figure, I think, in mm. maybe in my lifetime. Yeah. Right. There are also some conversations that she is maybe the biggest music artist of all time. Um, hmm. That's what that's a whole separate topic that someone I heard someone having on a podcast recently. And we yeah. can table that for another time. Yeah, that's a deep but one. What I'm seeing as a like interesting counter to that, this like, you know, this beloved sort of um, s- celebration and outpouring of of support for this one particular person. I'm seeing a lot of artists that used to be like universally beloved get their entire career deconstructed and torn apart at this point. Oh, okay. Interesting. So, you know the first person that comes to mind yeah. when you say that? Justin Timberlake. Justin Timberlake. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Are we talking about Justin Timberlake? So, Ooh. <laughs> and also Drake. You know, I've been yeah. reading a lot of like Reddit forums and like stuff. And I realize that people under a certain age, they actually hate the guy. Well, okay, that's that's interesting because those are two very interesting and different cases. Well, let's, let's talk. Let's start with JT because I think JT has a lot to do with a particular person, Britney Spears, who is so beloved and has people protecting her. For but sure, also a very the recent te- event, a very uh, a very telling memoir. Obviously, a hundred. I mean, that's I think the do- the first domino that fell for sure. But I also think with JT, it was more of a cultural context thing, right? Because okay. it's like I imagine that like. If he was doing the things that he was doing back in his heyday now, I feel like people would be super like, what the hell is this? This is not like that cool, honestly. Yeah. I think it was just so like of the moment. Oh, 100%. 100%. But it's like, but so my, my other thought about Drake, when you bring up Drake, is that I think that Drake's best work in his like earlier years of his career could still pop off today. Yeah. Well, because... Drake's come up in the late 2000s was similar to it, it was the right route to go. Mm-hmm. He got popular through internet. He was one of the first artists that was built from the internet communities mm-hmm. sharing his mm-hmm. work. His internet mixtapes, obviously, you know, Mac Miller followed a similar trajectory, Wiz Khalifa. This was very much of the era. Yeah. And I think that then became the template for like SoundCloud is how you blow up. And so it's not too dissimilar, but, you know, from like, you know, the, the way that things are now. Justin Timberlake was a Mickey Mouse Club kid on the Disney Channel and was a child star. Yeah. Or Drake was a child star as well. Let's not yeah. let's not forget he that. He was on TV too. But I think his he was not a known as a music figure, so that was separate. Justin yeah. has always been a music entertainer like multiple fa- but I I just think that like we're d- we're going to have a, a a thing coming up soon and this is kind of like the overarching part, part of this discussion where uh-huh. we're not going to have a lot of headliners left. You know, <sighs> that's an interesting thought, because not only are we producing less people that are like ubiquitously and like widely famous that everyone can agree on. Mm. We're going back. And the people that were these sort of monoculture figures, Drake was booed at Camp Flogna. And that was only a few years I ago. Know. I actually saw a rumor today that people are thinking that Drake and J. Cole might be Coachella headliners. And I feel like the immediate reaction is disappointment to that. Right. Less for J. Cole. He's got like legacy, I think, but like I feel what you were saying about like people being not excited about Drake oh, anymore. One hundred percent. Like I feel you know, I feel like this is just going to be something that, you know, uh people who throw festivals are gonna have mm. an interesting time coming to terms with. Like, is yeah. it gonna be like more of this insomniac model where it's like everyone is kind of equal on the bill and then the headliner is the experience? And you? I mean, I feel like we start <laughs> and you. I feel like we started seeing that with this year's Coachella for sure. Cause I feel like anyone who like w- was following me in the internet at that time saw that like I had a lot of thoughts and opinions about specifically this year's lineup and like what it meant for the coming wave of future headliners and like music consumption in general. And I think I think in a way you're right. Cause I think that's exactly what happened this year. Cause if we remember the headliners this year were Bad Bunny, Blackpink. And Frank Ocean. Yeah. And we and we talked about this on the la- last episode that like 
the yep. last Val Chad that, you know, it got a certain amount of discussion about like, are the who, what, like, are these people even worth being a headliner? And one of my, right. my friends made a point that like their collective, like Blackpink and Bad Bunny's like collective music career mm -hmm. was like less than eight years, you know, combined. Totally. And then like, yeah. or whatever, whatever the number is, but like not even enough that like any of the previous headliners would have been able to like you wouldn't even be able to start being called a headliner until eight to ten you know whatever so yeah i mean yeah and what i was gonna say is i think that we're already there arguably yeah. and that yeah. like there are like you said very few headliners left that hit the special place of being not only big enough but like still culturally relevant and like interesting enough to like hold a place like that on current festival lineups and i think the model that Coachella does is smart because I feel like this year, more than before, and they do this like I think pretty consistently across the years, but they 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 rely on the bottom to top lineup. You know, it's like yeah. they're hoping that you go and you go early and you find some of the cool new artists that are gonna be a big deal in like the next few years. And they did a really good job of that where like I felt like the most talk the most things that people talked about were not necessarily headliner related besides like, you know, the Frank Ocean incident and new headliners and all that kind of stuff. But like the sets that people were really excited about were all the other ones. Totally. And I think that like uh, on a wider conversation, I think the the issue with the, the fame conversation mm -hmm. is that we're seeing a lot of people who like can play for a crowd at a festival and like crush like a 20,000 person audience. Like, if they themselves were to go on tour, they probably would be able to sell, like, a fraction of that, right? Hmm. So mm -hmm. I think, like, the festival model has, like, man, it's just, like, such a difficult conversation, right? Because mm -hmm. unintentionally, it's both supported and grown the overall revenue of an industry and individuals, like, so much more than they could have ever imagined. Yeah. But made it so much harder for the individual artists to succeed in their own context. But at the same time... It also reflects on just culture in general, because I feel like it is very much now quantity over quality in so many, especially when it comes to music consumption. It's just like TikTok 15 second clippies, like who can get the most of those, you know, to become the next big star. And you're right. It's like that's just the way that people's brains operate now. Like they don't have time to like get invested in like. There, it takes a lot for someone to buy the headlining ticket for somebody's tour, like you said. So I think it's you're right. It's really yeah. hard for an artist to be able to like go on their own tour, especially like across the U.S., not just like the big cities or something like that. But as someone who grew up with the monoculture, you know, uh, both of us, like, what? But for you specifically, like, do you think that? How do you feel about it? Are you kind of bummed that we're losing these like shared pillars of of our culture, or do you think it's good because? It's leveled mm. the playing field. Honestly, no. I feel like, I mean, and this is probably just like a personal thought, but like I've always been a person that is really curious about wherever I'm not. You know what I mean? Like I've always been interested in learning more about, for example, I used to be a person that I was like, I listen to everything except for country music. Said that for so many years and then got an opportunity to work within or around the country music industry. And then you're like, yeah, country slaps. <laughs> Honestly, some of it does. I will say that some country slaps. And I also think like there's some really, really interesting things going on in country music just because of the way that their artists work and the way that their audience connects. And it's very specific to country, but at the same time, it's very similar in many ways to what we in dance music experience. Because I think there's um, a very deep connection between audience and artist in both of these genres or audience and music I should say more so than like others like I think obviously fans love music in general but like the stories that people connect to are very similar in like dance electronic and country uh -huh. and that's just like one example of like oh that's super interesting that like these different genres work so differently but like very connect similarly in some ways right so I guess what I'm saying is like I love learning about like these new spaces that pop up like yeah I'm a recent k-pop fan I wouldn't even say stan because I don't know enough to say that I'm a k-pop stan if you don't have a tattoo people. you're not stan level yet I know honestly 
I don't even have like I don't even have a black pink like little light, so yeah. I can't say that I'm a stan, yeah. even though I love them. Um, but I think it's really fascinating to like see something like that bubble up and like see what it does to culture and people and like what we then learn about like Korea and like the way that their music industry works. So yeah, I mean, I think country is a good comparison because country is something that's always existed, which some people, especially in our, our bi coastal uh, elitist mm. uh, bubbles, would probably say is not. A subculture at all it is for most of the country the culture yeah um and that is a monoculture thing that i think has kind of existed mm -hmm. uh i don't know if a lot of people know this but the biggest artist of the 90s by far was who oh. garth brooks so uh, okay that makes sense yeah because garth brooks is fucking huge huge still to this day yeah people and don't I think, know that but he's enormous totally and yeah. i think that stagecoach won't have as much of a headliner problem no you know? no like I, I mean look at them they sell out instantly yeah like i think year. i think country music is one of the few areas and of course like i'm saying there's exceptions to what i'm saying mm. i'm just saying on, on like a broader macro sense i think that it's just it's going to be a completely different landscape where i think the brands and the experiences and some of these things are going to actually have more sway than like the individual like the like you're saying the collective bottom to top is going to be yes. the the driving point more than the top to bottom totally and i think that's a good thing like, I'm not saying... I was going to ask, what do you think? Well, I think it's fine. It's just like, I was saying this a few years ago where I'm like, you know, ask any person who's of a certain age, like, who their most famous person, mm. their their favorite person is, the person that means the most to them. It's probably some, like, makeup tutorial YouTuber or some mm. role player on Twitch or something that you yeah. have no understanding or, or reference point for. And, like, mm. that's just... If that's the the environment and like the um you know the layout that they're growing up with then it's going like a few years from now we're going to see a tremendous impact on the culture i'll i'll tell i'll say one last thing on this like <laughs> like extends to movies right like we had the bob the the barbenheimer moment this summer barbenheimer, yep. and that felt like a monocultural kind of thing yes we're like okay everyone was going everyone was opting in from young people to old people is everyone collectively like had had bought into this thing mm -hmm. but movies overall are just kind of washed you know like going to see mm -hmm. a movie case in point the marvels which just opened up in theaters this past weekend it did yeah there you go <laughs> now granted it was during the middle of an actor strike where right, people are not allowed to promote it, the so, movie yeah made 47 million dollars at the box office that is I believe a third of what the first Captain Marvel movie made. It made over a hundred million dollars less than the first installment, which is the first time yeah. ever in history that a movie has fallen off by a hundred million dollars in Damn. its sequel. And it's, it, again, again, Marvel was like the last bastion of the monoculture where people were like, "That's something we all maybe, have in common." Maybe we had too much, honestly, because I, I have for a very long time believed there's been too much Marvel. There's oh, too you know, much Marvel, too much superhero. For sure. I mean, they it's, definitely we run it, ran it into the ground ten times over. Now. And I think excess and and oversaturation in the attention economy is going to affect every facet of the entertainment industry. But you know, yeah. that's that's just what I wanted to share with like kind of my thoughts on seeing Taylor Swift, but then also thinking about how lacking the rest of it all is. Right? It's mm. it's things are getting very top heavy. Like a lot of the numbers that I think people are going to report about the success of our industry is going to be propped up by a lot of these these cultural titans that can you know transcend the yeah it's a really interesting i mean yeah i i think god i've like i'm just sitting here thinking about like all the different toxic elements of like monoculture and like stan culture and all that stuff but that's a whole different conversation right, we right. won't even get into i know it, it's, it's it's enough for plenty of episodes but... yeah but when you say like things are top feeling really top heavy in mu the music industry i think that part is something to keep an eye on for sure because that reminds me of like the recent news where Spotify came out and said that they're only going to pay artists if they can reach over a thousand streams or something like that. And like that feels very like, oh, OK, we're focusing on like the top heavy artists. And like if you're a small, small bean, like good luck. We'll see you if you get to the top sort of thing. So I will say like that's the only downside I see of it or not the only, but one of the major downsides I see of of that is that. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's just tough. Right? Yeah, I love. So. We'll we'll uh, we'll more we'll to get, unpack. We'll there, get our Spotify sure. wrapped uh, in data and then compare notes at the yes, end of the year. Yes, more to come. We're gonna do a end of the year wrap up episode where we get to talk about this year and upcoming year. But since we're on the topic yes. of 
timing of the year. Yes. Wrapping up this this week's Val Chat episode. It is going to be Thanksgiving very soon here in the U.S. And it's a time where we like to think about things we're grateful for. Oh, absolutely. What are you grateful for this year, Chad? <laughs> I wish I had like a decorative Thanksgiving hat to put on I know. at this exact moment for those watching. I know. It's more fun. I want a big old gobble gobble turkey. Yeah. I'll remember for next year. I <laughs> please, please. <laughs> uh, well, I just got to say it, Val. I'm grateful for this podcast. Oh, you took mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got the same one. That's so cute. No, but yeah, say more. Well, you know, it it's really amazing because when we started this, I was like, "All right, you know." <laughs> wow. Here we go. I see. And this is how you really Sorry, felt Val. when I was Sorry. like, "Let's do a podcast." This is like, this eh. is when you're at Thanksgiving and people go around and talk about what they're thankful for, and someone yeah. starts crying and really letting you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, like I just wasn't. I don't go into things with a lot of expectations anymore, uh, or like. <laughs> It's too real. <laughs> I don't go in with like set, um, calcified, like a, like you know goals or whatever expectations because I like to practice what I've what I what has been called um, practical optimism. Mm, you know, like I do love that. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's going to be great. Realism. If not, <laughs> it's there's a chance that it probably won't be, and if not, so be it. So be it. Mm-hmm. But. Every step of the way throughout and just the way that people have been talking to you and I about it mm-hmm. and the messages that I get and getting to edit it and all of it, it's just been an amazing experience so far. So Yeah, dude. Thank you. Thank you. No, I agree. I will say, I mean, I won't harp too much on it since you already said it, but I agree. I think that it's been, hopefully for everyone listening too, it's been a fun place to have a lot of the conversations that you and I, I know we're having both together and with other people and friends and music or just fans of music, but also like, it's just nice to be opinionated and care about something, but have a place to discuss it and hear, hear from others. Like when we have guests and get to talk about these kind of topics too, like, it's really nice. And I do feel like dance music is one of those places where people like to say like, you know, there's not a lot going on substance wise. So <laughs> I don't agree with that. That's just what they're people not wrong, say. You know, yeah, sometimes they're not wrong. Well, I mean, I think a lot of it is that like, especially for people in our position, there's like not a lot of like therapeutic resources. I think a lot of it mm. is just like, I don't know. I think it's just, just like moving. Everyone's just moving fast, trying to do a lot. I think a lot of it time. is like, keep it moving, you know? Yeah. And I do think that there's something a bit problematic with that. But also, it's just a lack of language and communication that exists to, you know, sy- systematically. Seeing like a decent amount of people react to some of the clips and and the short form stuff as you know a gateway to finding what we do, which is awesome. You know, yeah, that's I'm true. I'm stoked that that is like the com- a component of the show. Yeah. But we really made this show for long form people. So if you like hearing like in depth discussions and good convo, you know, yeah, I you think made that- it to this part of the podcast, you're in it. If you made it this far, like you're tight. You're, you're pretty tight. You're in it. Uh, but you know, you know that this is who it's for. Is like if you're listening to this mm-hmm. right now, then this podcast is for you. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great one. I will say that that you stole mine. I'm sorry, but that's okay. Anything I think else? We're in agreement with it. Yeah, I will say. I think in addition to what you just said, obviously, I think the podcast and the conversations that we've had have um, helped to inspire this feeling, but. It makes me feel really like hopeful a lot of the times about like this world that we care a lot about, have spent a lot of time in. And it it makes me feel as though we're in a really nice place where artists feel comfortable to experiment and try new things. I feel like that's a consistent through line that we've heard through many of our conversations and just even our observations about what's happening out there. And it's really nice to be in a place like that where I don't feel like things are dying or you know getting stale i think that people are innovating and like feel really passionate about this place and the sound that we also are excited about so yeah it's nice it's nice to be in a place to like not only experience it and like go out to shows you know especially after years of you know being stuck inside and being like when the hell are we going to be let out again um but also to just like experience it and appreciate it and kind of observe it. And you and I get to sit here and talk about it and <laughs> see what comes next. So no, that's, that's all good. That's, that's right. That's totally right. You know, I, I think it's uh, going into next year. I'm feeling really, you know, hopeful. Me as too. Well, you know? Yeah. Because it, 
it's a really difficult time in general, um, just like in every particular yeah, area. Yeah, really just everywhere, it's just like, unfortunately. Man. But, you know, um, I think that there is meaning, you know, in, in music, obviously. And I think as you are, the longer and longer you do it for, it's hard, it's, you lose more sight of it. No matter mm. how yeah. driven and with it you are, it, it is it's tough. It's a natural cycle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at least I we use this as an exercise um, to stay hopeful and stay invested and yeah. interested. You know. Yeah. So that's cute and positive. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> that's right. And I love if you're listening. No, honestly, I think it's it's one of the best things is that there's actually people out there who appreciate it as well. So we and would do it still if it was just us. But totally. it's nicer when other people are listening to it. And to that one guy on YouTube Shorts who asked if this was a painted on beard, I will oh, tell damn. you, it ain't painted on. It's just perfect. Damn. So. Yeah. I know. It's shocking. <laughs> you tell him, Chad. This looks like Leonardo himself. Wow. Put, this is hilarious. Put put pastel to this canvas. Um, <laughs> you just really needed to say that part. Yep, that's right. <laughs> that's all we got today. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in Thank to you. all this noise. Thank you, Val. Thank you, Jose. And thank you, Icon. Everyone listening, we'll talk to you soon.